the most in-depth coverage of the silver and black as they set their sights on Las Vegas for 2020. Live from the CBS Sports Radio 1140 studios, it's silver and black today. Join the conversation by calling 702-889-5978. Now, here's Scott Gilbranson. All right, welcome back, everybody. The desert wind is a Raider. Good Sunday morning, Las Vegas and Raider Nation listening around the world. A special shout out today to Master Sergeant Jimmy Renfro listening in Afghanistan. Send me a note this morning. Thank you for your service. Welcome back to Las Vegas' only Raiders sports talk show, all sports talk show, that is. Silver and Black Today. I'm your host, Scott Branson, founder and publisher of silverandblacktoday.com. Today, joined by my co-host, NFL draft analyst for silverandblacktoday.com, and that is one Kelly Kreiner. What's up, man? Did you survive the Sin City blizzard of 2019? I did, man. I mean, it brought me back to them lovely, wonderful winter days back in Indiana, except <laughs> we actually got snow back there. Well, you know? real snow, and uh, but but now, how how long have you been in Vegas again, Kelly? Uh, a little, almost fourteen years. Okay, fourteen yeah. years. So you've seen it. I, 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 I've said it every ten years. We get a snow. Yeah, like that. I'll say I was here for the last snow that about ten years ago that amounted to people not being able to get their cars up the hill into the housing development that I lived in back in the day. And you saw just people trying to push cars up this hill that's nothing. And I'm just, <laughs> I'm just walking by laughing at people. Well, and we got we got folks out there who um, have said that the snow is causing the stadium. To be delayed, which is ridiculous. We're going to have Tommy White later. We'll talk about that in a second here um, as we have a another jam-packed show for you. It doesn't matter that it's the NFL offseason. Reminder, we are streaming today's show worldwide on Radio.com. If you don't already have this app, you're missing out. Radio.com is a place for best sports, radio, music, talk, you name it. Download it and listen to us live anywhere you may be. Also, we're live on video again today. You can come right into the studio with Kelly and I and Jason Stepanian. Jason, I called you. Oh my gosh, it's an inside joke. Uh, David Stepanian and Mark Bonilla, our executive producer, is also here today because he just wants to see us. Uh, but you can come in the studio on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter via Periscope, and on Twitch. We're back up on Twitch, by the way, for those gamers out there who want to see us. Always a ton of listener viewer chat happening in there. So join Raider Nation from around the world. And be with us on the video simulcast. In addition, check out our website, silverandblacktoday.com. This week, Kelly was a busy boy. Great pieces on what Raider fans need to watch at the NFL Combine starting this Thursday, as well as a piece on some free agents and much, much more, all on the only Raiders website based in the team's future home of Las Vegas, silverandblacktoday.com. Okay, let's get uh, topics on the table and tell you what's ahead on today's show. What might or should the Raiders do in free agency? That's a good question. Is a trade for Antonio Brown in the cards for the silver and black? Will talented offensive lineman Kalechi Assembly be a Raider come camp? Well, one of our most popular guests, Mo Moten of Bleacher Report and others, he writes elsewhere too, will be with us. He'll give us the lowdown on all of that, and you won't find a more thoughtful and informed guest than Mo. He's coming up next on this segment uh, right after our first break. So make sure... You stick with Mo's. Uh, I always get great feedback on Mo, so that's good. And um, we'll have him on to talk all about that. Then in uh, at the bottom of the hour, the tin. <laughs> I haven't talked about him in a lot because I think I had good feedback from our listeners, Kelly, who said, you know, don't give these guys credit. And I call them the tin foil hat guys. Um, <laughs> they're at it again. Ridiculous rumors and outright lies about the construction of the Las Vegas Stadium are making the rounds again. From Twitter to YouTube channels, circus clowns again claiming there are issues that will delay the Raiders' new stadium out there. So Tommy White, a member of the Las Vegas Stadium Authority Board, will join us live in the studio to give you the truth. Yes, even in our 2019 social media culture, facts and the truth matter. Tommy will update Raider Nation on the stadium progress and put to bed the nonsense. Well, um, White will be here at the bottom of the hour, so... Get ready for some truth bombs. Tommy does not ever, Kelly, mince words. <laughs> ever. <laughs> so It's like people act like nothing's ever been built in weather before. I know. I mean, yeah, yeah, we get snow, like I said, once a decade. Yeah. This isn't snow. <laughs> this is, I mean, this isn't bad weather. This is nothing that's going to hurt any kind of construction. Yes. And not only that, but remember, they built a stadium in Minnesota. 
Okay, but anyway, we're going to talk about that with him and get into him. Uh, the Las Vegas Stadium Authority Board, um, he, he, again, he'll be here even, um, uh, and that, again, that's at the bottom of the hour, just so you remember. The second hour kicks off catching up with some former Raiders, uh, and we, as Al Davis once said, and we talk about it all the time here, and that is, you know, once a Raider, always a Raider. Kalen Burnett, former Raiders linebacker and current player with the Alliance of American Football's Arizona Hot Shots, will be with us. We'll hear how he's doing in the new league and his plans for his future and talk to him about his time in the silver and black. Also, Kelly, Burnett has Nevada roots as he starred in college for the Wolfpack of UNR, so we'll be happy to catch up with Kalen and see how he's doing. Surprised you let him on the show being UNR. <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, I have, a, I have a child who's about to go there, so I have to soften. I, it doesn't mean I have to root for them, but but definitely uh, going to be have a lot more interest. So then after that... Um, and there's been some travel issues with him, so hopefully uh, we're going to connect. I think we will. Raiders 2018 sixth-round draft pick Azeem Victor will be with us live, a late cut with the Raiders this past season. Victor is also playing in the AAF with Steve Spurrier and the Orlando Apollos, who won again last night. Victor will tell us about his pro football journey as he works his way back to the NFL. We'll also talk about the NFL Combine, which kicks off Thursday in Indianapolis indianapolis i kind of put that together and about the raiders free agent targets for this off season we'll close the show with kelly's corner who the hell knows where that goes well actually we know it's actually going to go to a massage parlor Ooh, that doesn't sound great but anyway we'll talk about that there you have it raider nation you're up to date we've set topics on the table for you here on silver and black today on cbs sports radio 1140 now it's your turn pick up the phone give us a call get on the air 702-889- Five nine seven eight is the number, Kelly. And so we talk about um, the we talked about the stadium. Tommy's going to be in here uh, yesterday uh, on Saturday mornings from eight to ten. Uh, Tony Cardasco ho- hosts uh, our sister show uh, Saturday Sports Beat, and Tony had on Jeremy Aguero uh, from Applied Analysis. Jeremy's also uh, very involved with uh, and and briefs. If you if you watch any of the streams, he's the guy who's talking like a million miles an hour for like the whole session. Um, he, he runs the, uh, the board meetings and, um, Tony had him on and it was interesting because I know you and I have talked about this in the past, like the Super Bowl, right? The fact that, that the, that Las Vegas can get the Super Bowl, uh, I think the earliest, um, is 2025, right, Kelly? Uh, but then a lot of us have always said, do we need it? Because so many people come in for the Super Bowl anyway, it's besides the site of the Super Bowl, it's the most traveled to destination for the Super Bowl. So uh, Tony had a, a, just a, an amazing conversation. You can listen to the recording of that um, up on iTunes uh, for Saturday Sports Beat. But we cut out a couple of clips I want to play for you at the top of this hour. Uh, number one was about the Super Bowl. And here's a clip. It's a little bit of a longer clip. I want to play about the impact that uh, it would have on Las Vegas should the Super Bowl come in 2025 when the next opportunity pops up. So here's Jeremy Aguero of the Las Vegas Stadium Authority and of Applied Analysis talking about what the Super Bowl coming to Las Vegas at the new stadium would mean. Um, You know, in terms of the Super Bowl, you're absolutely right. I mean, the Raiders have talked about 2025 is the next available Super Bowl, the way the NFL is doing it now. So they're looking at 2025, 2026. Nothing is set in stone yet. But look, I mean, the Super Bowl would be the largest, single largest event in Las Vegas history, which is remarkable for us overall, right? I mean, you think about all of the events that have come to Las Vegas. You think of all the boxing matches, conventions that we've had, all those type of things. The Super Bowl would likely be bigger than any of that. And, and you know, the other part that, that is a little bit of a balancing is that, you know, we almost host a Super Bowl in Las Vegas in terms of the number of people that are here um, uh, more than any, uh, uh, almost every weekend. Right. I mean, you know, they, there's a lot of analysis that was done around the Minnesota Super Bowl a couple of years ago. And we look at the number of people that were in Minnesota for the Super Bowl. It's like uh, somewhere between 100 and 150,000, depending on what set of data that you look at. During that same weekend, Las Vegas had 300,000 people in town and we didn't even have the Super Bowl. So there is some balance that needs to happen there. But if you look at room rates, you look at what it means for our brand to be a Super Bowl city. You think about those type of economic impacts. There is a lift 
that comes with, frankly, the biggest sporting event on planet Earth. Well, the biggest sporting event for Americans on planet Earth, right, that, that we sort of think about. Um, uh, and, and the order of magnitude is really tremendous. I mean, that, that level of spending that I mentioned a little while ago in terms of the average spend per visitor, right, we know it is higher when a UFC fight comes to town. We know it's higher when a, when a big convention comes to town. We know it's higher when the rodeo comes to town. And the Super Bowl is likely to be the highest of them all. Jeremy Aguero. Well, there you go. So that was Jeremy Aguero from Applied Analysis and the Stadium Authority Board talking about the impact of the Super Bowl on Las Vegas and that it would be the biggest event ever hosted by Las Vegas. And that's saying a lot, Kelly, because when you look at the fact that Las Vegas has had so many big events and we have major conventions all the time, huge conventions. And and I know you, having worked in the service industry for a long time, you know this firsthand because you uh, work a lot of them. But hear what he says. I mean, is there any question in your mind that bringing the Super Bowl here is a no-brainer for everybody involved, including those of us here? Well, I think it's, like you said, the biggest thing is, like, do we need it? No. We don't need the Super Bowl here. Do we want it? Yeah. Because it is the marquee event. You know, it's not only would it be the – I mean, it's easily the biggest sporting event of the year. You know, you can say what you want about any of the other sports or anything, but the Super Bowl is the number one. So, I mean, you've got that. You've got a new stadium. You want to show that Vegas is a major city? Throwing a hell of a Super Bowl weekend is going to get that done. All right, we're going to step aside for our first break. When we come back, we're going to be joined by Mo Moten from Bleacher Report, fan He writes a bunch of different plays. One of the most level-headed guys that covers the Raiders overall, in my view. He'll be with us to talk about things like... Antonio Brown, things like Kalichi Assembly, and what the Raiders may do in free agency. <coughs> Pardon me. <laughs> I'm choked up. Uh, you're listening to Silver and Black Today on CBS Sports Radio, 1140 AM. A union we can count on. CBS Sports Radio, 1140. This is Cliff Branch, former of the Oakland Raiders, three-time Super Bowl champ, four-time Pro Bowl, and you listen to the Silver and Black Show. Indeed you are. Welcome back to the Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio in Las Vegas, Nevada. A sunny Las Vegas, Nevada, still snow-capped mountains from our, our big blizzard. All one inch of snow on my backyard lawn. Unbelievable. Uh, but... We're not here to talk about the snow. We're here to talk about the Raiders, and we're going out now on the phone lines with one of our favorite guys in the business, the most level-headed reporter, I believe, covering the Raiders, talking about the Raiders, and that, of course, of course is Mo Moten, who writes for Bleacher Report, Fanside, and some others. Mo, how you doing this morning, buddy? I'm doing pretty good. See, you say level-headed, but some people will probably call me a hater, but, you know, <laughs> I, I'll deal with that. Well, I'm you know... Okay with that. Yeah, I know. Well, one of the things, too, and we, we always tell people that because, you know, we live in an era where, where media has been democratized, right? So so there's a lot of fan-oriented media and sites and blogs, and there's some great ones, some great podcasts. I know you've probably listened to some of the ones around the Raiders. I have, too, and, um, you know, I, I, those guys are great, but that's not what we are, and that's not what you are. You know, when you're, when you're trying to be, you know, objective and report on a team, some, you're going to talk about the good things and you're going to talk about the bad things. So uh, I feel you on that one. Okay, now you've been busy this week, Mo. You dropped several pieces um, on uh, the Raiders, and we'll start with your latest on Raiders free agency, and um, and it it kind of came off of fellow Las Vegas JT the Bricks interview with head coach John Gruden, and Gruden dropped some nuggets on his and Mike Mayock's approach to free agency in 2019. Talk about what's different and kind of what we, we kind of gleaned from that conversation with John Gruden this week. Well, as you know, John Gruden is very open. Uh, sometimes maybe he talks too much about his plan. Sometimes uh, he may get himself in a little trouble. But um, he said something that I thought was uh, pretty refreshing as he sticks to it. And I'll quote, he says, we're not looking to add players at the end of their career. We're looking for blossoming young players. Those guys usually don't hit free agency. Now, when he talks about those guys, that usually don't hit free agency. He's talking about probably the Frank Clarks of the world, the Jadavion Clownies, the Demarcus Lawrence's. Those guys are probably going to get franchise tagging or get a long-term deal. But I think Gruden and Mayock will go after second-tier defensive ends, such as maybe uh, Trey Flowers, Dante Fowler Jr. He can even throw in Ezekiel Asa and Brandon Graham, who are older, 
but can still be productive in, in a in a role that they can suit in, in a system under Paul Gunther. And I think they can both have a kind of a re- reemergence. Uh, Ezekiel Hensley dealt, dealt with an injury last year, a shoulder injury, landed on IR. Brandon Graham, uh, not as effective as he was in the previous year, but again, I think he could be pretty effective. So those guys are, are people you want to watch out for. As far as safety position, I know Earl Thomas is probably the top prospect at at a uh, at position, but um, a little older, but I think he could still be effective. He led the Seahawks in interception before he got hurt, broke his leg. You look at a Landon Collins who reports came up, cleaned out his locker, so he may not return to the Giants. You look at Han Quentin Dix, who I've mentioned multiple times, Trey Boston. Those guys are all in play. Now, when you look at the Reggie Nelson, the Frosty Ruckers, the Leon Halls, Clint McDonald's, they served their purpose. They probably, they probably were there to teach the system to the younger guys, and now they can move on their way. Um, even if they do sign, they probably won't have huge roles. So we can just kind of scrap last season and look forward to the next season and the younger guys producing uh, – under Paul Gunther, under John Green, having a pretty solid season. Hey, Mo, it's Kelly here. Um, I I agree, and I'm hoping that Gruden's going to stick to this, but we all know that Gruden's not the biggest guy when it comes to coaching younger guys, coaching rookies, and everything mm-hmm. like that. But you see with this class, like I, I think Brandon Graham would be a great pick for him, but he is going to be 31. You know, uh, mm-hmm. Do you do you see do you see him sticking to this, or is he going to fall back in his old John Gruden ways of going to that you know early thirties guys, try to squeeze two or three years out of him, try to make him good, or is he really planning for the future this time? Well, it's good you ask that, and he did talk about how the league is changing, and I think he's if you don't evolve, you're, you're going to fail. You have to evolve with the league, and what the league is now is it's a matchup league. And I think he understands that. You need guys who can do multiple things. You, you don't need older guys who are who just have a, a specific niche, can do one job, and that's about it. You need younger guys who are versatile. And I think he understands that. He, he kind of hinted on that during an interview with JT DeBrick, that this is what the league is. Again, it's a matchup league, and I think he will go after some younger guys. Now, I will say, and I said this in the piece, that you still want some veterans in the locker room. And I think you get that from Jordy Nelson. If Donald Penn hangs around, he stays. You get that from him, leadership. Lee Smith, who's been around the race for a while, you get that from him. He's going to have his veterans, and those guys are going to get some playing time. But he also understands that you have all of this money. You have three first-round draft picks. You're going to have to play the young guys, and that's going to be the fabric of your future going into Vegas. And, he, and again, I think he understands that he's going to have his veterans, but the young guys will play. Again, we're talking to Mo Moten from Bleacher Report and others. He writes at Fansided as well. So, Mo, uh, another piece you wrote this week was about talented all-pro guard for the Raiders' Kelechi Assembly. Assembly had an up-and-down year, mostly because of injury. I mean, he was injured, yet due to um, his carrying the team's kind of the second biggest hat, cap hit, I think it's around $10 bucks for this season, some are speculating he could be a cut candidate I think that's a bad move. I don't think you do that when you have experienced linemen, especially an all-pro guy on the line, and you're rebuilding with some young guys on the line. You don't want to do that. How do you feel about that? You agree? I totally agree. And, and I'll just quick, real quick anecdote. This is why I pay attention to my mentions and people copy my mentions with comments. And someone made a good point. Do we really trust Tom Cable to develop uh, some young offensive linemen yet? Do we really? Because if you, if you don't, why would you cut? And establish all pro and start over, or maybe get a, or maybe uplift John Luciano, who hasn't played much, but he still needs he still needs development. So, would you want to cut an all pro established pro bowler for someone who's younger that Tom Cable is going to have to groom and develop? I don't trust Tom Cable enough to do that yet, and we haven't I haven't seen enough from Colton Miller or Brandon Parker to suggest that he can. I know uh, Colton Miller has been hurt. But again, he was he he ranked uh, he gave up the most pressures in the league, third most pressures in the league at 55, and gave up the most sacks at, at 16. Again, I know he was hurt, but he isn't the only player in, in the NFL history who's played hurt. And I feel like if he was that hurt, he sh- they should have sat it. But anyway, going back to Kelechi, uh, it's terrible move. You're going to cut him, but I don't think it happens. Uh, Matt Schneiman, I believe, of the San Jose Mercury News already said that Mike Mayock is a big fan of Kelechi. I don't see him going. Gruden also said, um, and David Carr said this on NFL Network, that the fabric of this team is going to be built upon it, built in the trenches. So basically they want to keep their interior offensive linemen. He didn't mention names, but if you're thinking about it, Fletcher Assembly, Rodney Hudson, Gabe Jackson, you have to figure those guys are keepers. 
Absolutely, and um, couldn't agree more. So now, uh, again, we're talking to Mo Moten. Mo, on the Raiders draft now, you also wrote a piece um, about uh, the Raiders draft and particularly about a guy Kelly has had actually on his uh, mock draft going to the Raiders or as a Raiders uh, toss, uh, possible top choice from day one if he's available, uh, and that's Quinn and Williams. Now, a lot of fans focus on the edge because the Raiders, obviously they have holes all over the defense, but because of the lack of sacks and because of the trade of Cleo Mack, a lot of fans focus on the edge, but you agree with us, right? That interior lineman, especially a kid as talented as Williams, that would be a great move, especially with the growing number of interior defensive linemen who actually lead their teams in sacks. Right. And, and absolutely. And I, and I think I've said in the piece that we have to get out of the mindset of your edge rusher or your defensive end has to lead the team in sacks. It, it's totally, it's a, it's a, it's an archaic way of thinking. And I think you see that with Aaron Donald with the Rams. Chris Jones, the Chiefs within the division, who I wanted the Raiders to draft, by the way, just putting that out there. Uh, <laughs> let his team, let his team in sacks, and those guys are, are the crop of interior guys who are coming up, and you know they're basically proving the point that again, your defensive and your edge rushers, you you want good players at those positions, but they don't necessarily have to be your best pass rushers. Your best pass rushers could come from the inside, and I think Quinn and Williams could provide that. And a lot of people said, well, the Raiders drafted T.J. Hall in the second round, Maurice Turks in the fifth round last year. Why would we draft Quinn? In? And I, and I will submit to them that both of those players, Hall and Hurst, both played less than 50% of total defensive snaps. So Paul Gunther said this when he took the job, that he was going to rotate players. And, and I didn't see that as a one-year thing because of the transition. I, I feel like that's going to be his plan going forward. He's going to rotate players again early, as I said. This is a matchup league. You know, you want to have players that come in on third down and rush the pass. You want to have players who can stop the run on early down. So you, well, you're going to have players rotating in and out anyway. I think Quinn Williams could stay on the field all three downs. He could stop the run. He could sack the quarterback. You saw, you saw evidence of both last year with Alabama. I know he's a one-year guy, but when you look at his upside and where you're going to be picking and the type of player he looks, if you look at his traits, his hand technique, everything, his step off the line, it, I, I believe he could be an all-pro player. And I don't think you pass up on an all-pro caliber prospect no if, if if you have a need to fill and you say okay i want the second best cornerback or i want the i want the third best defensive end i'll use montez sweat and i said this in the previous article that you don't want to draft a montez sweat at number four if you have a putting waves there you just don't reach for need over a, a high over talent player. right yeah no i agree mo and man i think it's going to be an interesting off season for the raiders and of course we have the um uh combine coming up on thursday so we want to talk to you after the combine uh, but we certainly think uh, and appreciate you joining us today. You can follow Mo on Twitter at M O E M O T O N, Mo Moten. Mo, man, thanks for joining us again here on Silver and Black today. Appreciate you thanks, guys Mo. having me on. I'll see you guys after the combine. Appreciate All right, buddy. You. Take care now. All right, that was Mo Moten from Bleacher Report. Uh, we'll have him back on, and we're going to step aside now for a break. When Kelly and I come back, we'll be joined by Tommy White from the Las Vegas Stadium Authority Board. You're listening to. The Silver and Black today here. CBS Sports Radio. Help us talk the Silver and Black. Call us at 702-889-5978. Here's Matt Gutierrez and your host, Scott Gulbranson, on CBS Sports Radio, 1140 AM. Welcome back to the Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio, 1140. That's right. The only all Raiders talk show in Las Vegas. We're proud of that. We are early. Yes, the Raiders are not going to be here until next year. Thanks, Mark. Mark's photobombing me on video. I love it. If you're watching the video, you can check that out. Um, Everybody wants their 15 minutes, man. Uh, Got to be on the camera. We're going to be joined here in a moment on the phone by Tommy White, uh, who's, uh, of course, the uh, general business manager of the local 872, the Laborers Union, but also a member of the stadium board here in Las Vegas to talk about some of these ridiculous rumors that are that are persistent. Uh, people spread the rumors and then say they didn't spread the rumors, and um, it's pretty crazy. But that's okay. I mean, we're not gonna we don't name names because we don't want to give people the attention. But um, it, it's it's one of those deals where you know if you're not in Las Vegas, it's hard for you to understand what's happening here, and I get that. But at the same time, it's also one of those deals where uh, it, it, when it happens, when things happen around the stadium, believe me, there's people here watching. It's not like 
the media is going to cover if something's wrong. I mean, cover cover up if something's wrong. Uh, and and that's sort of a little bit of what's been alleged, Kelly. And it's it's just weird because I don't think people understand how things are built in Las Vegas and how how just amazing the construction industry and all that is here in Las Vegas. So um, we're going to bring in Tommy White now to talk about this. Tommy, good morning, buddy. Good morning, guys. Sorry about that. I'm running a little late. Oh, don't even worry about it, man. It's you know we. Luckily, because of the phones, we can get you and 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 make sure that we don't have to uh, have to worry about uh, about you coming in. That's okay. No, no big deal. You're a little busy these days. There's a lot going on in Las yeah. Vegas. <laughs> yeah. But let's yeah, start. There is. There is. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Let's start with some of these ridiculous rumors that have been going around this month concerning the stadium project in, in particular. It's really, really laughable, Tommy. The first has to do, and this goes back a couple of weeks, but we haven't had a chance to talk to you since then, so we want to do it on the air, about some some problem, quote-unquote problem, with the steel for the stadium. What was that about, and, and how is the steel with the stadium doing? So, I mean, if you look at the yard over there on Tropicana, we got, we got enough steel in the yard over there to build a whole other structure, right? Um, I mean, the guys are on time on the steel, right? So... I don't know where they came up with the problem of the steel. I mean, it's a steel structure, right? Um, so I don't, I don't see any problems with the steel. I've been out there. I was out there yesterday. I actually drove all the way out there this morning. Then I had to go look at another future project that's coming up. Um, and, you know, they, they got these big masses on the, on the uh, north side um, that are going to wind up going up pretty soon. But there's no problem with the steel. I don't, I, you know, I really wish I knew where they, you know, these conspiracy theorists come up with, you know, there's a shortage of steel. You know, listen, even if there were, even if there were tariffs on the steel, which I, I believe there was, but that didn't change anything. Right. Um, I, I, I actually think they ordered the steel before the tariffs went into place. Um, but. There's no problems with the steel. We will have a stadium that's going to open up on July 30th or July 31st of 2020. I know I always say June, um, (laughs) and I know it's going to be June, but, you know, I mean, I got a little clock calendar on my, on my desk that ticks everybody by the the second. Um, I think we're at 522 days right now. Um, so, you know, I, I just don't I just don't get it. You know, I mean, there's so many other things we can come up with. But, you know, somebody wants to come up and say there's a problem with the steel. You got to remember that stadium is like a giant erector set. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, there's not another one built like it. So um, I don't see issues out there. I mean, we're hanging drywall in, the, in there already. Yeah. Well, and that's so, the, the Tommy. I was going to say that's the second thing I wanted to ask you about. Again, we're talking to Tommy White from the Las Vegas Stadium Authority Board and the local uh, the Labor's Local 872. Tommy, this week, and most of the people who listen to us here in Las Vegas know and around the country know, we had a few days of snow uh, and, and some rain over the past couple weeks. And about every 10 years, because I remember the times I was here, 1998, 2008, and now 2019, we get these anomalies where we have snow. We get snow accumulation but some of these nuts out there are saying the roof might not be able to handle the snow and that the weather in Las Vegas is changing and that we've had more precipitation than any time in our history, which is false. I checked. I called the National Weather Service on Friday because uh, they're, they're awesome, by the way, on Twitter. Follow them. Um, but it's completely untrue. Not only that, the stadium site received, according to their estimations, and their office is right down Dean Martin from the stadium site, uh, about yep. an eighth of an inch of snow. Did snow impact any progress on the stadium, and can the roof handle snow? No, uh, the <laughs> snow did not impact anything. I mean, you know, you know. Listen, Las Vegas is so crazy about what they do with the weather. They they even called for a school day off on a day it was sunny, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but listen, the snow didn't impact. The roof was built, you know, to uh, withstand, you know, a thunderstorm, a hailstorm. Uh, there's not going to be no problem with snow. I mean, listen, we go through this every 10 years, right? Right. And, and to be honest with you, I, I really wish it was like every two or three years because, you know, to have snow up in the mountains in Las Vegas, it, it looks really beautiful. Um, but we, we had no impact with the snow at all. The roof is going to be fine. I mean, I, I just, again, 
these are people. I would like really like to see one person that comes up with some type of theory that's an actual architect or an engineer <laughs> or even a construction worker. I mean, yeah. have a, even have a construction worker. What do we got? We got some guy that sits in his basement. Right, that does nothing but come up with these conspiracy theorists, right? I know, and and he's got a little bit of a following, uh, but so do I. But right? I don't see anybody that follows me talk about how that the stadium is going to fall apart. I mean, come on, really, give me a break. Well, and not only that, Tommy, but but part of that too, which I found, and and you and I talked earlier in the week about this as it was coming up, was the fact that um, you have you have also other people talking about how. Because of the snow, concrete got damaged, which shows no understanding of how concrete works. And by the way, Tommy, tell me if I'm wrong. Did they not build a stadium with like 60 inches of snow every year in Minnesota recently? <laughs> so, so Martinson, who actually did build uh, the stadium out there for the Vikings, right? I, I mean, I, I don't think it was 60 inches of snow every year. I think it was 60 inches of snow every couple of weeks, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, and they still went ahead and finished their, that stadium on time. It's the same builder, uh, you know, the same engineers that have worked on, on Viking Stadium, actually working on, on uh, the Raiders Stadium. Um, snow don't bother us. Rain don't bother us. Um, you know, we, we did the box culvert right underneath the stadium. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if anything, what we, what we saw was we got to see how good the box culvert actually works. Yes. Right? Yeah. Uh, because, you know, we had some water runoff. The stadium wasn't flooded out. Um, anybody that knows concrete, they know that concrete hardens in water. Look at Hoover Dam, right? Yep. Um, so, you know, the snow didn't damage any concrete on that project. Rain didn't damage any concrete on that project. And, you know, I didn't even have any guys let go early on that job. I mean, I, we had some road jobs that... Some of the guys got to go home early that one day. Um, but other than that, we didn't have anybody go home early on the stadium. Yeah, no. And, yeah, that, there were reports, too, that they weren't working, that work had halted. And, and boy, you know, I, I, again, people who are not involved in construction look from the outside and they think they know what's going on on the site by looking on a camera that's on top of Mandalay Bay. So uh, very right. interesting. Now, Tommy, I have to ask you this. Besides, I, besides asking you the question if you were on the grassy knoll in 1963 for Kennedy, um, <laughs> Have you ever worked? I mean, you've worked on massive projects here in Las Vegas going back uh, to the 80s, including uh, the Stratosphere Tower, including City Center, and pretty much every big project that's been built in Las Vegas in the last 25 years you've been part of. Have you ever heard so many dumbass rumors about a big project here in Las Vegas? No. And you know what? Probably the biggest project at one time would have been City Center, right? Um and we put up more steel in city center in, in and you got to remember city center is a confined space right um and we put up more steel in city center and we actually finished city center on time um uh you know they had an issue with Harmon tower but that wasn't a, that really wasn't a construction issue it was design uh, right? and actually worked yeah it was a design issue and um it actually worked out to the benefit for for both the contractor and, and MGM properties who owns city center so i've never you know in, in all the projects and, and really scott like you said going back my first job here in town was the stratosphere tower right and i worked up on top of the stratosphere tower when it was snowing on top of the stratosphere tower and it was like 65 degrees down on the ground right <laughs> so um and we were pouring we were actually pouring concrete that day on the top of the tower when it was snowing so um we've never had an issue with, with construction in, in Las Vegas. I mean, if you look at all the resorts, there's nowhere in the United States, and I could probably say the world, except for maybe Dubai, has some really tall, very tall structures. Um, but there's nowhere in the United States that where, where the construction workers out here in, in Las Vegas uh, can build something year-round. Right. I mean, we build. That's what we do. And you can, t and you can see that by, by some of the world-class resorts that we have along the Strip. Oh, yeah. There's no doubt about it. Well, Tommy, I appreciate it, man. Now, that steel, those big steel, uh, they look like big blocks. Is that the rest of the outside <laughs> structure before they then start maybe putting some stuff up for the roof? Well, I think what the, <clears throat> that's part of the outside structure. Then you're going to see some ramps that are going to come on the side. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like when you, when you watch the stadium being built, we started at one end. We worked our way all the way around. Uh, completed the circle. Then we worked our way around going up 
Um, and you're going to see that start to happen again. Um, you know, we have those, you know, we have some of the, the, uh, the, the biggest cranes out there that, that are in the United States that's going to be picking those cages up. Um, and, and listen, it's, it's just going to be a fantastic project. Absolutely. Tommy White from the Las Vegas Stadium Authority and from the Laborers Local 872. Thanks for joining us today, buddy. Thank you, guys. Go Raider Nation. <laughs> All right. Have a great Thanks, week. Tommy. All right. We're going to step aside for a break. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about the NFL Combine. You're listening to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. A union we can count on. Sports Radio 1140. Our companion website, CBS, well, not CBS, CBS Sports Radio 1140. You can find on radio.com or you can listen to all programming here. You can also find us at silverandblacktoday.com where we have stories. And, and, and in fact, this week, our own Kelly Kreiner uh, wrote a couple stories that we're going to talk about. And we're going to talk a little bit about first the NFL Combine and the draft but we have to go out to one of our, 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 our key callers every week, one of our great listeners, uh, our great friends, and that is Wally and Henderson. Wally, you want to talk about Robert Kraft, man. What's going on? Hey, Gully, I need your advice on something. <laughs> okay. So say you're a little Bobby Kraft. You're sitting around your board. You've got two decisions to make. A, you can go to Four Seasons, get you a nice $2,000 drop-dead gorgeous escort. Or B, you can get in your limo and roll up to a Florida strip mall for a seventy-nine dollar rub and tug. What would you do? Uh, you know what? My wife listens. I would do neither. No. Uh, you know what? If I <laughs> if I had the money, what, what kind of tool is this guy, man? This guy is something else. Well, if I had the kind of money that Robert Kraft had, and I was single and seventy-seven years old, clearly. Um, you know, they say money can't buy you happiness, but it can buy you a lot of things. So I, I get where you're going with that. And, 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 but Kelly has a take on this too. Well, you guys are missing the boat on this because you can eat a five star meal every, you know, anytime you want. Every once in a while, you just want a cheeseburger. <laughs> a what? Yeah. Every, yo, you know, you, you know, every once in a while, you know, it's yeah, you can do the whole high. I think in this case, thing. it was it was more like Chinese takeout. I see. I was gonna make that joke, and you stepped on the <laughs> joke. But that's all right. I'll give that one to you. But I mean, I don't know what he's worried about because I mean, it's only a te- it's only a ten yard penalty for illegal use of the hands. So oh. I mean, he's got nothing to worry about. Man, there there's so many. Thi- I mean, there's so many jokes. The me- I mean, Wally, are you watching the internet? Because you know, the internet can be the most awful place on earth right now. But with yeah. this stuff, it has been hysterical. The Photoshop pictures over uh, women saying this is the prostitute and it's it's Tom Brady. Uh, what do you what do you think? What do you think should happen to Robert Kraft if this is indeed true? Remember, you have the presumption of in- innocence in our country. So unless he is unless he is proven guilty or pleads, um, what what do you think the proper punishment for some for an activity like this for an owner? Uh, they're not going to do nothing. That guy has so much pull in the league. They're not going to make He's going to get a little slap on the hands. You as think long so? As he's not into the to the trafficking part of it. Just not a, nothing's going to happen to him. Well, and that's the thing too. I've, I've, I I I actually uh, had somebody I know say, "Oh, well, you know what? Um, you know, prostitution. You know, if you do that, whatever. But when it gets into sex trafficking, that's a problem. Remember, even." And I know what you're talking about. Sex trafficking now is is horrific. It's a worldwide problem. And we look at it as these people are kidnapped and they're shipped all over. But remember, sex trafficking, a local pimp who pimps out a woman is also a sex trafficker. So I think that, you know, either way, we look at it as a, a, a harmless crime sometimes, but it's really not. So I, I think, you know, I, I've heard some pundits, Kelly, say that um, that he should, if he's found guilty, again, presumption of innocence, if he's found guilty, he should be booted out of the league. I think that's kind of ridiculous. It's a misdemeanor. Uh, it, it's going to, well, I mean, it's going to be the same thing from what happened with Ursay, is they'll half a, half a million dollar fines, the most they can find him, six games away from the team, which he's the owner, who cares? You know, <laughs> it's like, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, the, the NFL can only do so much. The guy, you know, he's not a player, he's an owner. Right. The owner's not that much involved in the sport, you know, and I think I read somewhere that finding him half a million dollars would be finding the average American like two dollars and forty seven cents. <laughs> so it's like, OK, here's a check. You know, 
the one thing I found on this is Adam Schefter said he wasn't going to be the biggest name that came out of this. Right. Then the State Department's like, we don't know what they're talking about. They're basically saying like, oh no, yeah, he's the biggest name. So ah. they're just kind of, they're basically saying, oh no, yeah, you're going to remember this. If somebody else comes out, he may have just disappeared in the background. Now it sounds like he's going to be. He's going to be the top. Yeah, guy. he's going to be the big guy. Yeah. Now there might be local community leaders or people that are they're prominent in the community down yeah. there that might be part of it. But for the rest of us and across yeah. the country who don't live there, it doesn't really yeah, matter. Nobody cares. Uh, yeah. All right, Wally, man, thanks for listening. I appreciate the call. All right, man. Take a, have a good day. All right, you too. All right, that's Wally, our caller from from Henderson. Hey, okay, so so we have a couple minutes. Oh, actually, we only have a minute left. We're going to get back, Kelly, when we come back later in the show. We're going to talk about NFL Combine because you wrote a piece, and I invite people to go up and read it, silverandblacktoday.com, about storylines from the Combine. So. I think for the combine, for the for the average fan who's not a hardcore fan, the combine seems like just a lot of stuff, and you don't want to deal with it. So I thought the way you boiled it down on stories people should pay attention to is a nice little primer. Yeah, as 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 dumb as as dumb as it sounds for most people, and as dumb as it, and it is for me sometimes, the combine has so much weight. You know, it's you it's it's a job interview. You know, it's the biggest yeah. job interview these guys are ever going to have. You know, and a lot of times, you know, these, you know, the interviews we don't get to hear about. But, I mean, there's a reason that the NFL Network televises all this stuff now. That's how big it's got. People actually, you can bet on this. You know, people watch this. Yeah. It's, I mean, if had, you're, you're out there just, you're out there, you know, it's such a show. I've had people tell me that no one cares. And I'm like, uh, no, they televise all of it. If they, yeah. did, if they didn't care, they wouldn't televise it because they couldn't sell advertising. It's uh, pretty simple. Yeah, if they didn't have the ratings, you. Uh, I mean, and a uh, uh, under four five nine for the uh, forty <laughs> for DK Metcalf is the dumbest gambling line I've ever seen in my well, life. Well, I, you and I are going to run the forty later in the parking lot, and we're hoping that we can finish it in a minute. I I haven't ran the forty since college, <laughs> and it was because a uh, a quarterback at the combine ran a bad forty time. Oh yeah. So I said, well, I said that you know I can beat that. Yeah. So I went out, I ran it, I beat the 40, and I've regretted it ever since. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. We'll be back right after this. Darren College of... The most in-depth coverage of the Silver and Black as they set their sights on Las Vegas for 2020. Live from the CBS Sports Radio 1140 studios, it's Silver and Black today. Join the conversation by calling 702-889-5978. Now, here's Scott Gilbranson. Welcome back, everybody. Good Sunday morning to you here from the crew at Silver and Black today. You know, the great, the late great Al Davis once said... Once a Raider, always a Raider. And so we believe that here, too, on the show. And, of course, we, Kelly and I have been talking about on the show, too, a lot about the Alliance of American Football League. And uh, we're real excited to be joined this morning by former Raider linebacker, uh, the 2012-2013 season, Kalen Burnett. Kalen, uh, coming off a tough loss yesterday to Salt Lake, he's a member of the Arizona Hot Shots in the AAF, AAF. Excuse me, let me spit that out the right way. Kalen, man, thanks for joining us. How have things been uh, getting back on the field and playing under Coach Rick Neuheisel? Man, it's been a, a, a dream come true, actually. You know, I've been uh, out of football for a little bit. I was actually playing arena ball, but, you know, it feels great to be back outside, you know. And Coach Neuheisel and uh, Phil Savage just gave me a, a chance, you know, to keep my dream going. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that's what's great. Uh, we've really loved uh, being able to see – uh, players like yourself, and like you said, you, arena ball, but to get out and play on the big field and play uh, the the football game that you grew up playing and obviously went to college and became a pro doing is really cool. Now, for you to, to get back to pro football in that format um, and uh, is, is great. I mean, to have you come back out there, you had a stint as a coach at your alma mater uh, at the University of Nevada Arena. We'll talk about that in a minute. But what was your what what what's been your motivation to kind of uh, keep going? Because I think some guys get to the point where it's like you know they they might uh, with challenges and with setbacks or switching leagues, or whatever they might kind of say, okay, I'm done now. Uh, what is it about playing that still gets you fired up? You know, I, I'm young. You know, it's just something about you know that camaraderie and 
just being around the team atmosphere, you know, that it, I, I miss that a lot, you know, and just to just be around that, you know, that, that just really keeps me going. And actually, uh, when I got in the league, I told myself, you know, when I get around, you know, my mid thirties, that's when I'll hang it up. But, you know, as a young boy, you know, that was my dream to always, you know, play professional football, you know, and, you know, I just won't let nobody tell me no, that I can't, you know, and, yeah. uh, and you know, I, I've always been an underdog, you know, and I always, you know, had to prove people wrong, you know, and I want to show people that I could still play this game. Yeah. Hey, Caitlin, it's Kelly here. Uh, I've got a question for you. Anytime these, like, we saw it with the XFL one one year and out, anytime these mm-hmm. fledging leagues and things come up, everybody's wondering, you know, will this stick around, will this stay? Is that something that was in the back of your mind or some of the other players' minds? Or are you guys just out there, you know, we're playing football, we're going to do what we can, and we'll just let the cards fall where they may? Yeah, you know, that, that's above my pay grade. You know, I, I just show up on time, you know, <laughs> and, and just, you know, show up at practice, and they say game time is at 1 o'clock. Hey, I'm there, man. But, you know, that, that, that I'll leave that up to them, you know to make sure that this thing sticks around. But I have a really good feeling that, you know, this thing is going to stick around for a while. You know, they they have some big names behind it. So I'm very confident that this league will be around for a while. Yeah, and again, we're talking to Kalen Burnett of the Arizona Hot Shots in the Alliance of American Football League, former uh, Oakland Raider as well. Now, Kalen, um, what for you now, getting back out to the outdoor game and and getting ready uh, for, for, for playing this season, um, talk about that challenge for you and how it's been and, and really this opportunity that the AAF is allowing players like you who, who want to get back into professional football and hopefully back to the NFL. Um, what has that meant for you and, and, and what have you, how have you felt so far in doing that? Uh, real good. You know, I, I feel like, you know, it's actually an advantage, you know, and, you know, they, they want guys that's ready, mm-hmm. you know, and, if I'm a GM, you know, and I, I got a college guy, you know, and I have a, a professional guy that's actually been playing, been in pads last week, then, you know, we kind of have an upper hand, you know, and we got 10 weeks. The championship game is the week of draft day. So we in the pool with guys that's undrafted or drafted that's about to come in. And, you know, it's kind of like, you know, do do we take a, a college guy or do we take a guy that's ready? So yeah. it's an advantage. Yeah, no, that's cool. And, of course, the championship game, which uh, you guys as the hot shots, uh, one of the favorites to get there, and the game will be here in Las Vegas at Sam Boyd Stadium, a stadium you're familiar with. Um, yes. let, let's talk, uh, before we get to the college piece, and we talk a little bit about the in-state. I went to UNLV, but my son's going to Nevada, Reno, so – We'll talk about. He should. <laughs> we'll, t- we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, so you played two years with the Raiders um, and a couple other NFL teams after that in Canada. Um, what about your? Ex- what was your experience like in Oakland for you? I remember the big block kick, the punt. I think you had against the Giants. It's one of the plays that sticks out for me. Um, but what what was your experience like playing in the NFL and playing as a Raider in that silver and black? Uh. Probably the best experience of my life. You know, when I played that first preseason game, I was like, man, like, this is where it's at. Like, you know, Oakland was my first love. You know, when I got released from there, it really hurt me, you know. And, uh, you know, it took me a while to kind of get myself back together because, you know, when I got released from there, it it was from – I had my meniscus and all that. But, you know, once I recovered, you know, and recruited, got myself back together, you know, I I was pretty fine. But – you know, playing in that silver and black, you know, is it's nothing like it. You know, and like I was, like you said, you know, I went on the other NFL teams and all that stuff. But you know, the the fan base that the Raiders have, you know, it, it's nothing else like that. You know, it, it's probably the best of the best. Yeah, well, and and that's the thing too. I think that's why I let off the segment right. Uh, what Al Davis always said, and now Mark Davis said, which is once you're a Raider, you're always a Raider. When you become a Raider alumni. Um, you know, they're always welcome back in. Now, you were, uh, I know you're, you're too young uh, to really remember too much about the Raiders playing in L.A., but you're an L.A. kid, too. Uh, did you grow up a Raider fan? Actually, please don't be mad at me, but I actually grew up a Rams fan. <laughs> That's okay. 
But uh, I grew up a Charger you know, fan, so I'm, I'm worse than you because I was in the division. Oh, yeah, then you're going to get more <laughs> hell than me there after this interview. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, I, I grew up a Rams fan, but I'm going to be honest. Mm-hmm. Well, and that, you know, the, the thing is with, with – um, Playing for an NFL team, I always, I always thought that. I mean, I, I, I never even, even got close to even thinking about playing college sports. So forget about pro sports. But it always seems to me interesting when a guy grows up and you have a favorite team and then you're playing against them. But I'm sure you put that aside because you're a pro. Now let's get to the college thing because you have Nevada roots, right? So we're in Las Vegas, of course. I went to UNLV, uh, and and uh, I have to remind you, the cannon is red right now. I'm sure that's okay, not. That- for, for now. <laughs> for now. Yeah, although although now, it, unlike when you were there, although they had some good years too, but the, the, the UNR basketball team is really good now, top 10 team. But but playing playing at Nevada and 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 the, and the rivalry inside the state, you know, UNLV has never been very good at football. I'm very hard on their football program because they never seem to be able to turn it around. Um, you went back and coached for a little while with your alma mater. Uh, how was that, and what was it like going back after your playing days? Uh, it was real cool. Um, it was a lot of hours. And, <laughs> and not much pay, right? It, it was a lot of hours. You know, we, we'll probably get into the office around 6, and there'll be times I wouldn't leave to almost 11 or 12. I'm like, man, like, this is what coaching life is about. But, you know, I uh, I really appreciate Coach Pauline and the staff accepting me. And, you know, just kind of – that was kind of where I was trying to find, figure out what I wanted to do next. And actually, while I was there, I actually got a call from Saskatchewan, and I had ah. to leave there. And, uh, you know, just – you know, it was real good, you know, to get back to the kids because, you know, that, like I want to say that was probably my first time that I had went back and actually gave back to, you know, the younger kids on the team, you know, got to actually talk to them, you know, and – just kind of just let them know, like, kind of what the NFL is looking for and just what to be looking out for and what to do kind of to get to the next level. So, yeah. you know, I, I really appreciated that time while I was there. No, that's great. It's always nice to, you know, cause, cause, because you've, you've had so much experience. And, of course, your brother played in the league, what, eight or nine years, too. So, you, as a family, you guys have so much experience to pass on. It was nice that you were able to do that for a little while. Now, Getting back on the field with the AAF, I assume your goal is to get back to the NFL. And what do you think you need to do for the rate, maybe the rest of this season with the Hot Shots doing so well? What do you have to do to maybe uh, get folks to notice? I've already seen your name bantied about by folks in New York with the Giants and some other teams. Uh, but for you individually, what are you focusing on in your game to get back there? Uh, just really taking one game at a time, not – so much focus on my stats. I'm just really just trying to be a team player and just, you know, make the plays count, you know, don't count the plays. And, you know, like I said, just taking one game at a time, you know, if it happens, it happens, you know, everything is in God's hands, you know? So, you know, if it's meant to be, it'll happen. No, that's great, man. Well, we're, we're certainly glad to see you back out there on the field, especially, I know uh, I heard from Raider fans this past week who were excited to see that you were going to be on the show and and we wish you nothing nothing but the best. And we look forward. I think we're going to see you. I really believe we're going to see you and Orlando in the championship uh-huh. here in Las Vegas come April. I think so too. You know, it tell us in. We ready for him. <laughs> <laughs> I will absolutely, man. <laughs> Kalen Burnett, former Raider and current Arizona Hotshots linebacker. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. All righty. Thank All you for having me. You take care now. All right, Kalen Burnett, University of Nevada, Reno Wolfpack. Oakland Raiders, now Arizona Hotshots. Uh, but, Kelly, this is a great – this is, uh, again, one of the stories why I like the AAF. I know they're getting some bad press this weekend with the rating stuff, but it gives a guy a chance to play to get back to where he wants to be. Yeah, and that's the thing. A lot of these guys, some of them have dreams of being back in the NFL. Some of them, like you said, you just want to be out there, the camaraderie again. You know this probably won't or might not lead to another NFL job, but it's still, you, you know, everybody wants one or two more years of what they had. These guys get that opportunity now. Yeah, no, that that absolutely, and that's that's really cool. Um, and I think that uh, you know, Kalen, such a nice guy, and um, uh, his brother again too, played in the league for a long time. It's always nice. I mean, I think you, you follow players. It doesn't matter if they were with your team for a year or two. He's one of those guys who a really good guy, and um, so you like to hear that he's doing well and doing well. And it's good to see that. 
he's got another chance to do that. All right, we're going to step aside when we come back. More ahead on Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Drivers! The only way to take Silver and Black today with you is with the Radio.com app. Download it today and search CBS Sports Radio 1140 in Las Vegas and listen to us anytime, anywhere. If you don't have Radio.com, what's wrong with you? You can take Kelly and I with you in your pocket. Okay. <laughs> I like saying it. Uh, when Matt was on the show before, too, he would he would hate that. But I like it. I like it. I think people find the humor. But maybe I'm just wrong. Um, I am wrong maybe twice a year. You think? You yeah. think people oh, find, find the humor? I, yeah, I know they do. All right. They All right. tell me on YouTube. All right. So now let's get back to football. It's We're on YouTube. Talk, it's got to be um, true. Unfortunately, due to a travel delay with the Orlando Apollos, who are making their way to Georgia as we speak, and there was some big delays down there, Azeem Victor will not be with us. So we hope to catch up with him uh, next week to get his uh, his story, his journey in the AAF, and, of course, to talk to him about he's he was just a draft pick last year for the Raiders in the sixth round, Kelly. So we'll um, – We'll talk to him when we get a chance. So we're going to switch gears now and talk. We started a little bit of a discussion earlier, Kelly, about the NFL Combine. And for those of you who don't have the time or the inclination to really study the Combine, like Kelly and I are going to do, um, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a lot to take in, right? Uh, so Kelly wrote a piece this week on silverandblacktoday.com. If you haven't seen it, um, go check it out. But Kelly, you know, you kind of gave everybody a primer. If you're a Raider fan, uh, particularly looking at it through that lens, what are some storylines that you can watch for at the NFL Combine? The first one you talk about, we'll go through these one by one, was DK Metcalf's medical uh, checkout. Yeah. Check up, excuse me. Yeah. All, all of these I've kind of looked at just for the Raiders because they got the three first round picks. So I didn't go too deep into like, you know, the late round stuff. I just kind of stuck with the first round things. And uh, for me, DK Metcalf's my wide receiver number one. I think he's one of the, like, he's the one guy that can be that true X wide receiver that can, you know, stretch the field. But he has a neck injury. And, you know, if if that gets, if he gets red flagged by one or two teams on that thing, he's got a chance where he could really fall. You know, I think he's gonna. I think he's gonna wind up clearing with enough teams to where he's still gonna be a top ten pick. You know, that eight to ten range is where I'm expecting him to go. But if if there's any question at all, it's not like a knee or not like a, you know a shoulder or something. It's a neck. You know, that's yeah, a career. That's a career issue. Right. And but for and you talk about in the story, Kelly, that this is the kind of guy. If Al Davis was still around. He'd probably take him at four. Oh no! He, oh, there's no no, there's no question about it. If you think the Darius Hayward Bay thing was kind of <laughs> obvious when he ran that blade, no. yeah. Well, I, I mentioned in the piece three days before the draft, the commissioner was like, "All right, I'm saving us 15 minutes of ESPN airtime. The Raiders are taking Metcalf at four. <laughs> Let's move on." <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, no, I mean, and and the early word you said is that his neck is healed, but until I mean. They have to go through the medical test, but then during during the performance based tests on the field, whether it's running, whether it's catching, whether it's you know all the different moves, agility, that's where they're going to be watching too to see if any of that's been impacted because you have so much film on the guy. Yeah, it's uh he's going to destroy the combine. I mean, he's one of those just physical freaks that's going to just tear this thing apart. You know, so like I said, that's why you know the medicals will be big. You know, I don't think you're really going to notice any issues like you're saying out on the field. Uh, but I mean, it's it, it's it's going to be a huge issue. It could be the difference, like I said, from going to the, you know the top ten in the first round to falling maybe into the second or third because this draft class is just so deep at wide receiver. Yeah. Now, uh, Kelly, the next storyline you had, and it's funny because on, on our um, our different platforms that we're streaming video today, Facebook, YouTube, and Periscope, we've had a bunch of folks talk about how they believe that Ed Oliver is better than Quinn and Williams based on our discussion with, uh, with Mo Moten earlier. I totally disagree. But one of the things that you talk about as a storyline to watch for Raider fans, because there is a possibility they could take Ed Oliver, uh, is his measurables. Describe what you mean by measurables and how it might impact his draft stock. Uh, for Ed Oliver, the biggest thing, the biggest issue he, he's going to have is height and weight. Um, there's and the NFL is changing, but I mean, there's still that kind of old school mentality 
where each position has to have like certain, you know, height, weight issue, like certain height, weight numbers they want to see you hit. And if you fall under or over those things, they, you know, that's the first question mark they look in your game. And with Ed Oliver, it's not so much the height, um, but it is his weight. Uh, you know, Aaron Donald slipped in the draft because he was, they thought he was a little undersized at 295. Um, Ed Oliver was listed at 274 as, as our late as last year. You know, we don't have an official height and weight, you know. But, yeah, if, his, if he comes in in that 270, 280 range, that's going to be an issue with his stock. If he comes in at 295, 290, and yeah. he doesn't lose any of that explosiveness, uh, four is definitely is definitely a possibility because I know Mayock is a big Ed Oliver guy. Oh, there you go. So that's uh, good insight. Now, uh, speaking of wide receivers, uh, two, and of course one that I'm partial to because of Forks Up Sun Devils, is uh, Nikhil Harry and Kelvin Harmon. What you say Raider fans should focus on there, if, if, if there's a possibility they become part of the silver and black, is their 40 times. Uh, we know Nikhil Harry, big receiver. He gets those 50-50 contested balls a lot. He's a great target in short yardage situations because of that. Um, what do they have to do from a 40-time perspective to really elevate their stock? But both of them are both of them can get separation, but it's not just that just that speed. With Harry, it's more of his size, and with Harmon, it's more of his route running. You know, if these guys run in the four four range. You know, going to help their draft stock. If they hit the four, five, and above, that's when you're going to see a maybe slide a little bit. You know, because when you watch the tape, it's just you don't see that hot. You don't see that top end speed you want from a first round wide receiver. You see the separation. Harry's great with yards after catch, but you know that's in the pack. You know that's in the pack ten. Yeah. You know, it's not in the NFL. You're going to have to beat press man coverage. You're going to have to get through the zone. So you're, they're going to want to see that they're, they've got that top end speed, that second gear that they can get to. And, I mean, neither one of them are going to be blazing that 40. But, I mean, if you get in those low 4.4s for these guys, you know, mid 4.4s, it's going to be a huge, huge for the draft stock. So they, they go from being first rounders to second, late or mid second rounders because of that? Or, or are they going to stay probably between, I don't know, 20 and 40? Somewhere around there. Yeah, they'll they'll both be off. I think they'll both be off in that. They run good forty times. You're looking in the mid first round. Mm-hmm. If you know if they, I mean, if they struggle a little bit, I mean, because I don't, I don't think either one of them's gonna have a terrible forty time. Right. Um, it'll be that late first, maybe early second. But I mean, in my opinion, both these guys are guys that you can take in the first round. Okay, so then um, you also talk about uh, after the top three linebackers, who's next? So, so this is the opportunity for linebacker, college linebackers coming out in the draft to kind of show, to make an impression, because right now it doesn't look like there's anybody that's bubbled up other than the three, which is, of course, White, Mack, and Bush. Yeah, it is wide open in that middle linebacker position after you get these guys you know, most most people they throw the outside linebackers in with the edge. So whenever I talk linebackers, it's for me it's that middle, it's that middle uh, linebacker position, mm-hmm. right? And I have no idea who I would cons- <laughs> I, who I like. If you told me right now who's your number four, I could throw out five or six names, and I'm not excited about any of them. Like there are some guys that have some potential and could be there, but there's not that one person that has separated themselves from that group of four or five guys that could be that like second tier the way the first three guys have from everybody else well and to me that's that's what that's what i find exciting about the combine is there are there's a guy who is out there and suddenly he just blows it away now sometimes that backfires on a team because a guy has a great combine and then he doesn't end up panning out as a player more often than not that's (laughs) that's exactly what happens because you you when you look at the combine numbers if somebody blows away what you were expecting you're like, okay, well, I'm going to go back to the tape now and see why, you know, what, where, where was this on film? And Rashawn Gary is going to be that guy this year. Rashawn Gary is going to completely blow away the combine. You go back and you watch his tape, and you're like, I don't see almost, I don't see any of this, yeah, on film. Yeah. you know, why is, I mean, why is he this athletic? Why is he just this freak of nature? But he's just, you know, he's he's Superman in the combine. He's Clark Kent on tape. All right, well, Kelly, uh, before we take a break here, um, the last thing you talked about was Kyler Murray. What do people have to watch 
Is it is it the throwing? Is it the running? Is it his interviews? What is it about Kyler Murray that people need to watch? Well, I mean, his biggest thing is going to be the interviews because he's going to have to convince he's going to have to convince these teams that he's all in on on all in on football. You know, he's already he's walking in there with one foot out the door because he has a pro career waiting in baseball. Um, for what we're going to see, uh, his weigh in is going to be huge. You yeah. know, yeah. how tall is Size. he? How big is he? Right. You know. Um, Five six. I, I've heard. I've, I've heard. You know. I've heard five ten two oh five is what some people are projecting. Um, that's awesome if that's what he plays at. To me, right? Because it was like anybody can gain weight. Yeah, I threw my little conspiracy theory in there that um, if I'm his agent, I'm like, you're not running at the combine. You're going to run at your pro day. Pack on seven or eight pounds. You're not going to notice it on his frame. That's going to bump you up. We can cut that in the three weeks, four weeks before your pro day. Blaze your forty at the pro day. Yeah, it's a big business uh, opportunity, so that's how it has to be handled. It's not just handled from a football t- standpoint. So, all right, well, we have run out of time in this part of the show. We're going to step aside. When we come back, we're going to talk about off the radar free agents Raider fans should pay attention to. You're listening to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. CBS Sports Radio. This is Mark Bidane, president of the Raiders. You're listening to Silver and Black Today. Welcome back to Silver and Black Today. CBS Sports Radio in Las Vegas. You're listening to Las Vegas' only all Raiders talk show. Streaming worldwide on radio.com, of course, and on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, and Periscope. We have a lot of viewers there. Uh, We've had a busy day, so I haven't been able to chat as much with people on there but we see you guys occupying each other it's great to uh always have folks on there and talk about um funny david david crockett on youtube holy commercial break (laughs) i don't know what that means man was it too long for you uh but hey we we bring the entertainment we're uh we're doing our best and we appreciate you guys being here all right so kelly now we're going to jump back in to the Raiders and uh another subject uh not related to the combine on although this time of the year all player personnel stuff is sort of mixed in and, and related. You did another piece on silver and black today.com this week. Um, and it was about uh, free agents, free agents that Raider fans might be not thinking of. Some of them aren't technically free agent yet, or they might be. Um, and, and everybody's looking at the big names, right? And yep. we could, we could name those all day, but what they're not looking at is guys who could maybe jump in and help this team, especially on defense, uh, and so let's let's run through the number, or should say the guys there. The first guy you talked about, uh, the Giants' defensive end, Brandon Graham. Why would he be a guy that fits well in Paul Gunther's system and with the Raiders? Well, uh, the thing about Graham is, if you look at his sack numbers, they're not you know they're not great. Yeah, but if you look at his pressures, he's all over the field, and that's one thing. Um, sacks are a little overrated. Because, like, if, say, Graham, he blows by his guy and he's going there, the quarterback runs the other way to avoid him, and the other end, the quarterback runs into a sack for somebody else, Graham made that play, but he gets no credit for it. <laughs> you yeah. know? And even though he's at 31, he's thirty. He's going to be 31, I think 32 by the time the season starts, um, he's still a guy that's, I mean, he's got some juice left to where he's not going to be your number one main pass rusher but for a guy that I think you're going to be able to get on a halfway decent contract would go great, especially if the Raiders draft a young guy on the other side. Yeah, so so someone on the end there that's got the experience who can help out. And to your point, pressures are pressures. And this is what we were talking about with Mo earlier in the show, right, which is if you have Quinn and Williams, if you're fortunate enough to draft him on the inside, again, people focus on the edge, but if you have a great inside push – not only is, is the NFL changing and you're seeing more of that, guys leading their teams in sacks, but also it frees up that end. Yeah. Uh, and it gives you that opportunity. So uh, another guy that you mentioned in your story here is one that really intrigued me because he flies under the radar and had all season long as part of that kind of, I think, somewhat overachieving Bears team, uh, and that was Bryce Callahan, the quarterback. Talk about Callahan. I, I think that – do the Bears let him go? or Is he going to be on the market? And if he is – if I'm the Raiders, I'm all over it. I think he's going to get to the market, and um, the Ravens signing Tavon Young, giving him that early extension, is going to kind of set his market. 
I was I was hoping maybe the Raiders were looking at four year thirty two million with about twenty twenty two guaranteed. Uh, Young got basically a three year twenty seven million dollar contract. Wow! So he's yeah, uh, Bryce is he's looking in that probably ten to eleven range now, which to me is a little much for a slot corner. But with so much three wide receiver sets that are getting ran now, slot corner is a starting position. You know, it's not just you know, it's not just you're out there on third and long or anything like that anymore. You know, it's you you need a third corner, and corner's probably one of the. It's probably the most important position in football. Nobody talks about. Well, and not only that, but when you talk about Callahan, twenty seven years old, so very young. Um, and so he's basically in his prime, as you say. Uh, also, with, with, to your point about three wide receiver sets, you have to look at divisional matchups too, right? You talk about yeah. in your article the Chiefs. <laughs> You're going to play the Chiefs twice a year, and the Chiefs are pretty loaded right now on offense with Mahomes and, and their core uh, Hill and, and Kelsey, all these guys. So, so it makes even more sense to invest in a cornerback, but yet you can also draft uh, defensive linemen and other needs and go get a guy like this. Yeah, it's a cor- corner class, not the best this year. You know, I think, you know, so if you're going to, you know, spend some money out there and try to get the young guys, he was a guy I would definitely go after because there's not anybody that's going to just shoot out when you're, you know, second, third, fourth round to be a slot corner because your main corners are probably going to, you know, three or four main guys are round one type prospect. Now, another guy that you mentioned at cornerback as a possible under-the-radar free agent is a guy who has all the talent in the world, but he can't stay on the field, and that's Jason Verrett. Yeah, I mean, whenever when he plays, he's good. You know, he's undersized. It doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, but uh, – and, and the Achilles injuries could be – that could be brutal for him. You know, we saw Richard Sherman came back from Achilles injury and did pretty well. You know, I mean, he he did better than I thought he was going to, and obviously Sherman's older. So, you know, you still got a younger guy, you know, you've you've got some a little bit of history of a guy coming back and playing at a decent level. So, I think you could get him extremely cheap on a one-year kind of prove it deal and that gives you the inside track. Say if he comes back, he is playing well, you can sign him to a longer-term deal. Well, and one of the other big needs Kelly for the Raiders clearly is and uh, we talked about it earlier, linebacker and one of the guys that you have um, pegged there as a possibility for um, for them is Jordan Hicks. Talk about Jordan Hicks and why he might be a good shot. This guy is a great middle linebacker. Uh, just he's all over the field, and he's the he's what you need in the NFL now because you need guys that can cover. You need guys that can go sideline to sideline, and you know when he's on the field, like that that's what he does. You know he's had some injury issues the last couple of years. Um, I think he only missed four games last year, so it wasn't too bad. But he was never quite back up to like being 100% the whole year. He was kind of nicked up and just kind of playing hurt the whole time. Um, if you can get this guy and put him in the middle of your defense for the next three or four years, if he can stay healthy, he can be a cornerstone. And I, I, I hear it all the time. Gunther's system does a demand on linebackers. He's got to switch up his system. You know, <laughs> it just just the way the league is now. You have to have linebackers that can cover, and you can't just be grabbing. You know, it can't be an afterthought anymore. You've got to have guys out there that can play. No, exactly. And I think I think that's the thing. Two people think about is they oh well, their system like last year with the offense, it was Gruden's system, and Gruden's system doesn't do this. And you can see that his system is 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 dated, and so on and so forth. But but any coach worth their salt, right, is going to make adjustments. I mean, that's what coaching's about. Coaching is about making adjustments. And to your point, that even comes with scheme. And so some of that will, too, I think, depend, Kelly, on what happens in the draft. If you get a bunch, if you get another inside guy, you get an edge guy, you fill a cornerback role, and then you get a line, you know, you suddenly are going to look to the strengths of what talent you have at that moment because it is a building year. It's not going to be a team that's going to compete for a championship yet. So you're going to adjust until you get – now you might get to a point where you have all the talent you need and you can run things a certain way, but the talent will dictate what you run, correct? Well, I think it should because I think you should take the talent and work around that. But, it, I mean, they've done it in the past is they've built around their scheme at the cost of talent. Uh, you know, it's like, well, this guy is a better player, but he doesn't fit what we do. We're going to take this guy instead. And I think that's a mistake. Because, I mean, 
to a point. I mean, obviously there are certain things. If you've got comparable talent, obviously you're taking the guy that fits your scheme. But give me talent. I will make my you know give me the best player I can get at each position, and I will make this work. Well, and I think that's where sometimes ego comes in from a coaching perspective. We've seen it, right? We've seen coaches, and I'm not saying this is the Raiders coaching staff, but we've seen coaches who will refuse to change things because this is the way I do it. And then you look at talent, you say, okay, you have this great running back or you have this great receiver or this tight end, and you don't use them. Uh, it just, it's like, you know, to your point, you have to use the talent you have and adjust to it, uh, not just be so rigid because that's modern coaches who succeed are not that rigid. Yeah. Well, Raiders fans have seen that with the Nande Asimov going to the Philly. Yeah. We're taking one of the best boundary corners that in the NFL right now. Oh, we're going to play him in zone. <laughs> I can't play zone. Ah, oh, he'll get it. You know, it's like you, 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 you get a guy for a reason. You take, you know. You work on their strengths. Oh, you don't try to work. You don't try to work them into your system. Yes. Yeah. You know. And that that that'll be interesting to see what the Raiders do. And I think we'll learn a lot as we head into the draft with them uh, and where that goes. All right. Well, we are going to step aside here and take a break. When we come back, it's Kelly's corner. He's going to talk a little bit about I don't know massage parlors or uh-huh. something related to the Robert Kraft thing, which. Uh, We talked about a little earlier, but we'll be back with Kelly's Corner to close out the show. You're listening to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. This is Silver and Black today, live on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Here's your host, Scott Gulbranson. Welcome back, everybody. Silver and Black today coming to you from CBS Sports Radio 1140 in Las Vegas and on the interwebs via radio.com and also Facebook, Periscope, YouTube. You find us anywhere, anywhere you can view or listen. And we're there because that's what we do. Thanks for joining us again. I am Scott Branson, joined by Kelly Kreiner. And this last segment, we always have a little fun with it. Um, not enough fun to get arrested. But uh, Kelly, um, something happened this week with a massage parlor or something. So... First of all, you have a story about a massage parlor. Now we're a family show, yes. So we yes. don't we don't get too uh, uh, risque here. Uh, but uh, tell us your story first, and then let's talk about this Robert Kraft thing. Okay. First off, I'd like to say I like your San Diego Padres. It looks like it's brand new. Did you just buy that? I don't know a day or two ago. No, the sh- the the hat is not. The shirt is. Okay. Yeah, there was. Yeah. I got I got a new shirt. Uh, they're going back to brown and gold next year. Yeah which they should have done a long time ago. Yeah, okay. Instead of looking like the Milwaukee Brewers, like Man. they have for the last 10 years. Nobody knows either one of those teams, it don't matter. <laughs> oh, yeah, the whole Robert Kraft thing popped up, and it's like, and especially, you drive around Vegas, you see those places all over. I mean, they're all over town. What? In every every strip mall you go by, there is a there is a massage parlor and everything in there. Well, uh, and, they're, and they're completely legit, legitimate businesses. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure all of them are. You know, except for that one he went to. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, for, for years I was a bartender here in town, mostly graveyard shifts. And uh, there was a little Mexican restaurant I worked at, and there was an establishment like this a couple doors down from, you know, the bar. It never failed. I would get guys in there all the time that would go over there, then come in and grab a couple drinks and dinner afterwards. And, you know, most of the time people would want to tell me about, you know, their experience. And I'm like, I, I don't want to hear this. This, you know, don't care. Well, one night, and unfortunately, the this one happened on my night off. I had to hear about it from the actual bartender the next time I saw him. But it's like a Tuesday at 3 o'clock in the morning, and there were a couple of you know, uh, we would have Metro officers come in that they would eat dinner at the restaurant because we're open 24 hours. They could come in, sit in the restaurant, and have dinner. And there were uh, two Metro officers in there having dinner. And out of nowhere, this uh, little Asian lady runs into the restaurant trying to get the cop's attention. And so the bartender goes in there to see what's going on. And a few minutes later, a guy walks in the vert right behind him, and he's already, he's walking in already talking, kind of trying to, like, he's trying to explain something apparently from the whole gist of the situation was when the lady ran in, she was telling the cops that the guy was not paying for the services he was rendered and she wanted them to arrest him. For the massage. Hey, I don't know what went on in there. I wasn't there. I'm just saying that. So the you guy, sure this isn't a story about you? 
No, hey, I, you know me. I pay up front and I tip well. You do, absolutely. You're a service industry guy, so yes. Yeah. So the guy's like, well, I'm not paying for that. I, I, that's not what I went in there for, blah, 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 you know. And one of the Metro officers looks at him and he's like, listen, sir, it's 2 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday, <laughs> and you went to a massage parlor. He goes, we can't prove what went on in there. We have a pretty good idea what went on in there. Pay the lady, or we will just arrest both of you. <laughs> so they're sitting there that they both. So the guy ends up paying the lady and everything, but so they had a left in there. But I'm just trying to imagine that being in that bartender, because I mean, nothing really happened in that restaurant. It was rarely anything happened. Just seeing this play out in front of anything, and you're just like, yeah, this is my station in life to where this is what happens at work, and I have to just be like, eh, it's it happens. Well, it it it, and then trying to imagine. Not quite that same scenario, but a scenario that it started with, which is illegal acts at a massage parlor with a 77-year-old billionaire. Like, Wally said it earlier, you know, I would go pay for a high price is what his his take was on it. it. You know, people make bad decisions. It's just, you know, when somebody like this makes a decision like that, um, if you're a Raider fan, you're celebrating because you hate the Patriots so much. It, it <laughs> any just, it any just embarrassment, goes. you know, is good, but it's it's... It, it, it really is mind boggling, and 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 the, the the way it's going to be treated and handled, I think you're right. It's going to be five hundred thousand dollar fine, six game suspension, just like Polian had um, in in Indy. Uh, or, I'm sorry, um, Ursa. Ursa, yeah. Uh, with in Indy with the pills and all that kind of stuff and cocaine or whatever it was. Um, it was just pills and cash. Oh, pills and cash. And that's right. I love how everybody made a big deal that he had forty thousand dollars in cash on him. And everybody's like, what's he going to buy with $40,000? The same thing a billionaire buys anything he wants. Yes. They carry, they don't carry that money around because they're actually going to use that. Right. They're flashing that everywhere because they can do it. Well, and living in Las Vegas, Kelly, and you and I spend time in, oh, in yeah, casinos, you see it all over the place. Yeah. It's not, it's not, now for most people in, in America, just walking around their hometown. Yeah. Nobody's carrying $40,000 that you know of. Um, uh, now if you're on the border, it might be cartel folks, leave them alone. But uh, other than that, it's, it's one of those deals where it's hard to understand what Kraft was thinking. We don't know. We're not going to know. Um, but Hey, but you, you see, you own, see things like this all the time though. Yeah. It's like you said, you would go get the high priced escort, but it's, it's why Cheeseburger. you, it's why you see a guy who has a beautiful wife or can, you know, it's why Tiger Woods was sleeping with a Perkins waitress. You know, <laughs> right, when he had a sometimes wife, you right. just yeah. Sometimes you just need, no pun intended. You need a relief. You just want that. <laughs> you don't care. It's like oh, this boy. is what's a ava- this. You know, it's like I said. It's like you know what? I don't eat at McDonald's because the food's great at two o'clock in the morning. I eat there because it's there. It's easy. I want this. I can get it. It's the easiest way to do it. It's crazy. Yeah. Uh, shout out to our viewer. JF, who is also a Cuban brother. My wife's Cuban, so we're in the family, brother. Uh, thanks for watching, man. All right, well, that's going to wrap up the show, Kelly. We're, we're already done, man. It goes wow. by fast, right? Yeah, maybe for you. <laughs> I feel like I've been here forever. <laughs> I appreciate that. Wow. All right, that's going to wrap it up, folks. <laughs> Make sure you stay connected to us. Visit silverandblacktoday.com. 24-7 coverage of the Raiders and, of course, the move to Las Vegas. Follow us on Twitter at SilverBlack2, the number two day, SilverBlack Today. And check out our podcast available on iTunes and Google Play and Spotify, everywhere else you get it. Uh, the archive of this radio show as well goes up there. So when this show's over, we edit it, we put it right up for you to listen to so you can hear it uh, during the week on your uh, commute, whatever it may be. So don't miss the hijinks off the air. For my co-host, Kelly Kreiner, thanks for being here, Kelly. Yeah, no problem, man. And engineer David Stepani and our executive producer today was Mark Bonilla. We sign off, but we never say goodbye, Raider Nation. No, we don't. Thanks for listening, and until next week, may the autumn wind always be at your back. Make sure you drop us a note anytime. Sign up for our email list so you don't miss any of the greatest information there is around Raider football. And I'm interested, Kelly. I know I, know I just threw it to the goodbye, but I'm wondering... This time next week, what our takeaway will be from the Combine? Uh, the first thing is everybody will be, I can't believe they put this on TV. <laughs> because if you're not really into it, it's the dumbest thing imaginable. Yeah. But if you're into it, I mean, you're 
it's like that's it's everything. Your, that's your thing. Everything. Yeah. All right, Raider fans. Well, thank you for joining us today. We'll talk to you next week. Same time, same place. We'll we'll be here. Talking Raider football. You guys take care. For Kelly Kreiner, I'm Scott Branson. Silverandblacktoday.com. We'll talk to you next week. Bye, everybody.